Heart to Heart with Michael. I am your host, Michael Lieben. In this, our second season, our theme is a celebration of life. Today's episode is called Celebrating Jay Lee. And with us today is Christiana Whalen, mother of three, two heart-healthy sons, and Jay Lee, who was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and an intact atrial septum. She had the Norwood procedure at three days of age. She went into heart failure, which prevented her from being a candidate for the second open heart surgery, the bidirectional glen. Jay Lee was listed for a heart transplant at three months of age, and sadly, she passed away at four months and nine days. Christiana, welcome to Heart to Heart with Michael. Thank you so much for having me here. Not all of our listeners know exactly what hypoplastic left heart syndrome is. If you can take a couple of minutes and explain it, that would be very enlightening. Yeah, so Jay Lee had um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as HLHS. Um, and essentially what it means is she was missing the left ventricle in her heart. Um, so obviously the left ventricle is imperative. It's not one of those things that was going to correct itself um, or grow back or anything like that. Um, she needed surgery in order to survive. So as you mentioned, um, she also had the intact atrial septum and needed immediate intervention at birth to open that up and then um, had her first surgery at, at three days old. Oh. Tell me about her life. Jaylee spent most of her life in the hospital. Thankfully, we were able to bring her home um, a couple different times. Um, she was home once for just a couple days and then at um, the longest period of time, she was home for one week. Most of her life was in the hospital. And we just worked around that. We wanted to spend as much time together as possible. So we would just hang out in her room with her. Um, our two-year-old was with us. And we would watch movies together, watch football together. It was football season um, when she was with us. We watched football together. We'd read books. And then when she was home, we just wanted to do things as normally as possible um, which was hard because we had to keep her away from people and she was on oxygen and she had a G-tube. Um, but we were able to go on a couple walks as a family. And um, yeah, so it was just really important to us to be together as much as possible. What's that like? She's in the hospital. You have other kids. How do you have a normal routine like that? It includes being home when you need to be and being in the hospital. How does that work? Thankfully, we had a lot of support. Um, my family was amazing. Both our families were amazing. Um, but my parents got us all a apartment right by the hospital. And um, my parents and my husband and my son and I all stayed there. And so um, one of us was always with Jaylee and one of us was always with Ezekiel, our oldest son. And um, we would just just do everything we could do to to make it work. Um, and it wasn't, it definitely wasn't a relaxing time and it wasn't a time where we got much sleep, but, um, you know, our kids are a priority and we just made it work. Now you're waiting for a heart. What are, what are the odds? What are the chances of getting a heart for someone that small, that, that young? We were never given percentages. Her surgeon would always say you're either zero or a hundred percent. So we never got a, a percentage. Um, I I did know that um, there's not a lot of donor hearts for a baby her size, um, but the team always remained hopeful, and so we always stayed really hopeful. And um, I think at that point we just expected her to get a heart, and we just prepared um, and trained ourselves to know how to take care of her once she got her heart, never really letting ourselves think about the fact that she might not get one in time. What kind of expectations did you have? This was something we had not prepared ourselves for. Um, during my pregnancy, I researched and researched all about um, her condition and the typical three-stage surgery, but we had not been prepared for the transplant. The biggest thing that took me off guard was the rigorous um, protocol they have. And so we had to meet with um, many different members of a team, including a psychologist, a social worker, mm. many doctors, because they wanted to make sure that um, if Jaylee was to get this precious gift um, of a donor heart, that our family would be able to take care of her and that, um, that we were qualified to take care of her. 
And so I, I really had not expected that. Um, and it was several days of them meeting with us and doing paperwork and in training before, um, we were even approved for her to be on the transplant list. You know, that was my next question. Does that actually affect your ability to to receive a heart? I mean, do they have to approve the family psychologically? Do they have to determine that this family can take care of the heart before yes. they even say yes? Yes. Yes. I had so no she idea. was not even listed um, until they went before, I don't know if it's a board or a committee, um, but they had this big meeting, and then someone came in and let us know she had been approved and she was going to be listed. It's interesting because I know this from the other side. Mm-hmm. When my daughter died, we donated. Hmm, and it, okay. It always seems like such a happy arrangement because you know somebody has somebody needs it, and it works out. Yeah. And I think also from other families I've known who were recipients, where it didn't go well for them. Uh, People go into this thinking, well, it's like it's like a car. It's like switching parts. And I and I've heard this from other people. I'm not. This is this isn't my words. They say, and you know, oh, we'll just go. We'll have it done. It'll be over. Apparently, it's a lot more complicated than that. And when we were talking about that with my daughter, the doctor said a transplanted heart, as good as it is, it's still a diseased heart. Yes. And what you're essentially doing is you're trading up. Yes. From what you have to something less life threatening. All that's going on and she's only a few months old. How do you handle that? How, what What's going on in your head during those weeks? I think we just wanted her to be okay. And we were going to do anything it, it took to make her okay. And, you know, we realized that, like you said, a donor heart is a diseased heart. And she would probably, if she were to survive, she would need numerous heart transplants uh-huh. during her life. Um, but we wanted as much time with her as possible. And... Um, we were prepared to live that lifestyle, you know, the the lifestyle she would have needed to be on multiple medications a day for the rest of her life. There were certain things she would need to avoid. Um, we would obviously have to keep her away from germs and, and our life would have looked very different. But she, you know, you love your kids and you'll do anything for them. And we were we were prepared for that. That was just where we were at. We, we, we just wanted to move forward. Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on Michael's program, please email him at michael at hearttoheartwithmichael.com. Now, back to our program. Christiana, in our first segment, you told us about Jaylee's heart defect. Did you find out about that in utero? Yes, we did. Um, We did. It was at um, about 24 weeks. I had an ultrasound, a fetal ultrasound. And um, that's a day I'll never forget the doctor um, turning off the ultrasound machine and the expression on his face and um, him telling me that there was something very wrong with the baby's heart. And, you know, in that moment, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if that meant she was going to survive the pregnancy. I didn't know if that meant she had a tiny hole in her heart. I had never heard of hypoplastic left heart syndrome before. So um, he was a very kind, compassionate doctor. I'm forever grateful to him for for catching the defect and also for the compassion he showed us. And um, so after he he gave me the news, he um, gave me time to call my husband. And my husband came over from work. And then he sat down and met with us. And... um, Basically, he wanted to give us some options, but to, to us, even from the very beginning, there was never options. We were going to fight for Jay Lee. I think in that sense, you're very lucky because most doctors who do the ultrasounds are 
gynecologists. They're not mm-hmm. heart specialists mm-hmm. unless there's reason to to be there. In other words, if you have a child after a heart child, mm-hmm. you'll get you'll get that, and and you'll also get a better level of uh, of uh, vision. Mm-hmm. So all all we saw was floor chambers and beating, and that was enough. In the end, we got the all clear. Mm-hmm. We had no time to prepare. We was on arrival. Here you are. So you're lucky in the sense that you had the time. Did you use it well? Did you research and and get ready and learn? Oh, yeah. I'm definitely a researcher. And so I think I spent every free moment I could reading things, uh, joining support groups, um, joining online support groups, and Mm -hmm. just trying to get my hands on anything um, I could so that we could um, prepare and connected with many other families who had children with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, that was a huge comfort to me because I would see these children who were three, four, five, mm-hmm. even even older, and they were doing well. And so I thought if they're doing okay, my baby might be okay. So I spent well, a lot of time with those moms. I think another thing that makes you lucky is every time a, a baby is born with a heart defect, it's always better than it was a few years before. I remember our pediatrician, the first thing she said when we told her it was a heart defect, she said, well, you're lucky it's now and not 20 years ago. Yep. And and now it's 20 years later. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, you know, you're in a much better situation because even the technology has improved so much. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we were told the same thing that, um, you know, 30 years ago, there was no babies that would survive with HLHS. And so we were in a much better place. Well, I remember even 20 years ago, I met somebody here where I live and she was explaining to me what HLHS was. And she said, it's just a death sentence and we'll we'll wait it out Hmm. because that's all they had to tell her. Yeah. 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 But, but you know what, let's talk of happier things. Uh, Let's talk about Jaylee's first, some of the things that, that you saw for the first time that made her smile, that made you smile. Let's hear about that. Yeah, so I was trying to recall the first time she smiled, and um, she spent a lot of her life sedated and intubated, and Mm -hmm. so it's hard to to recall her first real smile, one that wasn't all the drugs she was on, to be honest, Uh, but she had a beautiful smile, and um, she would would light up when we walked into her room. And um, she loved, she had a mobile, one of those spinning mobiles, and she would just look at it and um, have a huge smile on her face. So she definitely had happy moments. Um, Some other big firsts were the first time the doctor let me try to nurse her um, because she had been tube fed. um, And I wasn't really able to do that more than a couple times. So that was very special. Mm -hmm. And the first time we were able to take her outside, the first time we were able to go on a walk as a family, Um, Those were big moments for us and ones I'm so thankful for. Those are beautiful moments and they're really very nice memories. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I'm thankful. Um, Our son was only two at the time, but he still remembers those moments with his sissy. He will talk about specific moments um, with her. Yeah. All right. Then let's go on in the same vein. What are some of your favorite memories? Like I said, I think the walks were really special. Um, Today, earlier today, I was watching my two boys taking a nap, and I was thinking about uh, when we brought Jaylee home from the hospital. She and our um, older son, Ezekiel, were able to take naps together. Of course, I'd be right there with them in between them or next to them, but um, there was something so normal that they weren't able to do in the hospital together. So that was really special, just seeing them cuddled up together together. And I think other memories were just being with her in the hospital, being able to hold her. Um, and then on 4th of July, we were we were in the NICU, and I was able to sit and hold her, and we were able to watch the fireworks together. And I remember thinking, oh, this, you know, this will be the only time we'll have to be in the hospital. Hopefully next year we'll be home for 4th of July, and we can be together as a family watching fireworks somewhere you know, somewhere much more beautiful, but I'm just so thankful for that time with her um, because it was the only holiday we got to spend together as a family. You know, I think sometimes it's those idyllic moments that seem so normal to everybody else that they may not even notice them. Yes. But but we who've been in these positions learn how to recognize the beauty in the very, very Mm -hmm. tiny things that happen. Exactly. That's so true. 
Well, it's very sweet, and I feel as if I I can see those moments. I can see those things happening because I, like every other parent, you know, when they happen and and you're there, it, it's just so tender, and it's those moments that stay with you forever. Yes, yes, those are the moments that matter. So tell me how the rest of the family pitched in. I specifically want to hear about your parents, everybody's lives being thrown out of whack, and how you had to draw in so many people to help just to keep things moving. Tell me about about that part. Yes, so thankfully we're so blessed um, by our family stepping up. And like I said, um, my parents are able to get an apartment right by the hospital and um, within walking distance. And so between my husband and myself and my parents, we would just be going back and forth and um, someone would be with Jaylee playing with her or reading to her or or praying for her or whatever it would be. And then some of the others of us would be with Ezekiel trying to keep his life as normal as possible in this little apartment by the hospital. And um, we just did everything we had to do because that's what you do as a family. And um, my parents did way more than they, they needed to, but um, we're just, we're so grateful. And um, there are a lot of special memories together um, at the hospital, we were able to have my grandfather, so Jaylee's great grandfather, come visit, um, and we have pictures of them together, which is just so special. And um, other family members, my husband's family, would pitch in, and um, some of his sisters would stay with Jaylee to give us a date night or to give us a night to to catch up on a little bit of sleep. His parents as well. My brother would would come by, so um, it was a a family effort, you know, and you really learn when you're going through this as a family, that family is all that matters and you'll do whatever it takes to make it through a tough time. Did this widen out? Did you, did your friends get involved? You mentioned praying for her. Does, was there a wider group of people who were helping out on, on, on any level on that level, maybe just bringing you food? Meals? Yeah, absolutely. We had um, so many friends that were doing meals, helping out with our older son um, lots of prayer chains, um, you know, friends that were house sitting for us or, um, you know, checking our mail, things like that. It was definitely um, a team effort and not just our family, but friends and churches. Um, we, we were involved in two different churches at the time, and both our churches um, were very helpful. I think people don't realize just how wide a network you build in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not just going to the doctor. It's not just going to the hospital. There's so many things around it that, you know, it's your new normal, but people have no idea. And, and frankly, I hope nobody ever has to have that idea, but people don't have any idea how big and how wide this gets. Yes. And, you know, we really built a community, um, at the hospital as well. Mm -hmm. Um, that was something I had not expected, but there were many friends we made, that continue to be some of our best friends. Mm. Um, And sadly, some of their children have passed on as well. Um, And so we've attended each other's, um, we've attended their children's funerals and um, we've all walked a journey that no one else can understand and that definitely builds a strong bond. This program is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.hug-podcastnetwork.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. I was five hours old when I had my first surgery. The only advice I can really give someone like that is to be there for your family. This is life and you have two choices. You either live it or you sit in a corner and cry. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of Heart to Heart with Anna. Join us on Tuesdays at noon Eastern Time on Spreaker, our blog talk radio. We'll cover topics of importance for the congenital heart defect community. Remember, my friends, you are not alone. 
I am with Origami Owl Jewelry, and we personalize lockets. It has helped me heal so much by having that locket. I've had other friends and customers who have created lockets. They love their lockets, and they gift lockets to people who are bereaved, or they're celebrating somebody. To get your own Origami Owl locket, contact Nancy Jensen on Facebook or her website, nancydancyme.origamiowl.com. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our program, please send an email to Michael Lieben at michael at hearttoheartwithmichael.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Michael. Christiana, let's talk about some family traditions. What do you do revolving Jay Lee? How do you memorialize her at home? We try to include her and her memory in as much as possible. Um, so we do visit her grave a couple times a week. Um, it's really important to us to keep her grave site looking nice and um, to just create that special spot to come and remember her. Um, Ezekiel calls it, think about sissy. That's what he calls oh. her grave site. Yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time there. Um, we talk about her all the time and, um, the color purple, I won't get into the whole story, but the color purple is something that really reminds us of her. So whenever we see purple or we have a color choice, we choose purple. Um, and it always makes her feel a part of our day in that little way. That's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, on her birthday and, um, the anniversary of her passing, we usually um, do a balloon release or something special to really, um, you know, take that time as a family to celebrate her and to grieve her at the same time as well. well I don't see a, a contradiction there. I think it's okay to grieve and celebrate. Um, you're celebrating their life. You're celebrating their their happiness, and you're celebrating the the time. Uh, and and you're grieving that that has a, has ended, but you. you doesn't have to end in in in, in any final kind of way. That's I, I a really good believe, point. I think one of the things that that one of the reasons that we do this, and and we certainly here in our house remember our daughter and celebrate her whenever we can. But the idea of keeping her close to us, even as a memory, keeps her alive for us. Exactly. And I think the, I, I've said this before, but I think the way we remember our loved ones is the way they will be remembered by others. Mm-hmm. And we have an obligation to pass that memory and that joy to as many people as we can. Yeah, that's so true. It's so important to us. And I think that's why it's hard when you don't feel like other people are remembering your child. Um, and so we do as much as we can to make sure um, others around us remember her, too. Uh, th- that's very important because then they get to know her and they get to feel her presence in the same way that, you know, al- almost the same way that, that you did. Yes. How old are your other children? Um, so our oldest is about to turn four. And then we also have a little guy who is nine months. Oh. Yes. Yes. So they're fun ages. <laughs> Define fun. <laughs> they're busy. <laughs> The ages, but it's really sweet, especially as our youngest is getting a little older. You know, it's really fun just to watch them um, spend time together and start to be able to play and roughhouse a little bit. Now, the youngest one has no real uh, connection or memory at all to Jaylee, does does he? No, he he doesn't. Um, just what we tell him and what we talk about. Well, what do you tell your children about her? We talk a lot about her smile and her strengths, and um, we talk about the things she would like. You know, if we see a purple flower, we talk about how Sissy would have loved these flowers. Um, We talk about um, that their Sissy is in heaven and that they'll get to see her again someday, but not for a very long time. And obviously, that's a concept that's very hard for children to grasp, Um, but it's important for us to know that they will see their sister again. How do you explain heaven to them? You know, um, as a Christian family, we talk a lot about God and about Jesus and that, you know, God created the world and Jesus died for our sins and um, that they're in heaven. Um, And so because of what the Bible says, Jaylee got to go to heaven too, um, that 
um, and that they will that they will see her again in a in a place that's not scary or painful like the world can be sometime, but it's the happiest place in the world. Um, our oldest is very into Disneyland, and so we tell him heaven's even better than Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so I think he's excited <laughs> for that concept. Wow. Yes, yes. Has he been to Disneyland? Yes, yes. He has been. Has he seen um, a little a little taste of heaven? Has he seen it? <laughs> I, yes, he's been maybe uh, six or seven times, and we're, we're going again in a few months. But it's his, it's his happy place, and with all he's been through, it's just such a joy to see his um, exuberance and his. Um, just, you know, the joy he gets to feel when he goes there. Well, in that sense, I think he's sort of untouched by the pain because he was very young and very unable, I think, to really understand what the pain was about. Mm-hmm. Kids, it's, it's, kids can process and go go move on much faster. Yeah, it's interesting because he brings up Sissy every day yeah. and... um he says, I miss Sissy Mommy, but I'm sure that's also because he hears us say that. Uh-huh. Um, but several of our friends have had baby girls recently, and I think that's been triggering for him mm-hmm. because he will talk about his friend's baby sisters and then say, I miss my sister. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think he's going through his own grief process, and he always will. But I'm thankful that um, he was as young as he was when it happened. He sounds very resilient, though. He sounds very, like he has his own sense of joy that's very, very strong. Absolutely. How will your family continue to celebrate Jaylee? Like I mentioned, we talk about her all the time. And um, one thing that I do is we have a Facebook page where um, we used to write her medical updates for people to pray while she was still fighting. But now I really use it as a place to share memories of Jaylee and to process our grief. Um, so I do a lot of blogging on there and um, it definitely feels like a place that I can celebrate her, that we can celebrate her um, and others get to share in that celebration of her as well. Um, and then, like I mentioned during holidays or during birthday um we do bigger celebrations at her grave site. I also had a little project I had been doing for a while where I would send out purple headbands to um, heart warriors that were still fighting, especially um, children who were in the hospital fighting. Um, and I sent out several hundred headbands thanks to a lot of generous donations. And that project has slowed down over time, but it's something I plan to pick back up in the future. Um, because it's healing from my heart to see other people remember Jaylee and to also know that um, they're remembering her and also celebrating the strength that each warrior has on a daily basis. And so the headbands feel like a way to do that. That's really, very nice. I, I like that. I do. Thank you. Thank you. I think for a lot of kids who didn't know her, but maybe received that that band so she's almost more of a, a, a attained some sort of superhero status they, they didn't know her yeah. and yet they can feel some of that strength from her yeah. in a sense maybe she's out looking over them now yeah yeah absolutely and i get pictures from parents all the time um of their warriors and the headbands and they tell me that very thing that Excellent. they find comfort knowing that um jaylee might be up there watching over watching over the their children and that concludes this episode of heart to heart with michael thank you so much christiana for coming on our show and sharing your experiences and advice with us thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to talk about jaylee and how much our family loves her thanks for listening to us today find us on itunes and subscribe and please remember our loved ones are still with us as long as we keep their memories alive thank you Thank you again for joining us. We hope you have gained strength from listening to our program. Heart to Heart with Michael can be heard every Thursday at noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next time when we'll share more stories.